History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 103rd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And today's episode features a suggestion by our listener, Heather Williams, who's also administrator of the Spooktacular crew page. And that location is Glam's Castle, Denise, over in Scotland. So we're going to Scotland once again. Perfect. We love Scotland. And I just like the name Glam's Castle. Well, this castle has connections to the royal family, and it has some legend and lore that is a lot of fun. So I think everybody's really going to enjoy this episode. We want to direct you to check out our website, historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we got some feedback over on Twitter. Dirty Bob let us know that he was listening to the 100th show, Denise, while he was sitting at the first Meridian in Greenwich. Oh, that's cool. He said, isn't that kind of odd? I told him to buy a lottery ticket. And Patrick Trimble over on Twitter said, thanks to the great Jessica Chobot, the History Ghost Bump podcast is one of my favorites. Keep up the good work. It's fascinating. So thank you for that, Patrick. We appreciate you sharing the show. And then over on Facebook, April got back to us and let us know what her reborn dolls were and gave us a link to her Etsy shop. Uh, Sarah's joined us over in the Spectacular crew and she let us know that she's really enjoying the podcast. And she said one of the reasons why she's enjoying it is because she grew up in a haunted revolutionary era stone farm house, formerly a tannery and part of a limestone enterprise in rural central Maryland. Isn't that cool? That's very cool. Her parents still live there. So party at Sarah's house. <laughs> I've been around ghosts and spooky places all my life. And I love the stories about old places. And apparently she had some stories when it comes to this home. And she let us know that it has three known ghosts, a man, a woman, and a little girl. They've each put in appearances over the years, and they once found a child-sized footprint in the dust when there was no children in the house. Wow. I said that. that Oh, you're probably getting ready to say it. That reminds me of St. Augustine when they had the the footprint. Exactly. That's what I'd said. I said, oh, that muddy footprint in the St. Augustine lighthouse, same thing. She also said there's been strange noises and very distinct cold spots. The house is 240 plus years old, and it's got a great history. They have a policy of cohabitation and not disturbing the ghosts. (laughs) Very, very smart, because you never, ever want to tempt the spirits or disturb them. That's right. So I told Sarah we'd love to have some of those stories when it comes to our Halloween broadcast later on this year. We love true ghost stories for that. And Rob over at the Spectacular Crew sent us some great suggestions for haunted locations over in the U.K., and he was teasing us about the way we pronounce stuff, Denise. Are you kidding? <laughs> we were getting teased about our pronunciations, but they're so pristine. He said when he was listening to us talk about St. Augustine, it completely threw him off. And Josh jumped in and said, well, I'm sure that the way we say St. Louis isn't right either. And Rob pointed out, yeah, in Arkansas, Kansas is Kansas. Why wouldn't it be Arkansas? But it's Arkansas. Wait, wait, wait. He's from the UK because I work with a gentleman that grew up in the UK and Sometimes it's very hard to understand him. So who is understanding who here? Well, and he let us know that one of the words that we've had a problem with, I think I've called the town Lancashire, and he let us know that it's actually Leicestershire, (laughs) which is not anything like I think I said it. Oh, okay. Well, if he's correcting us for UK words, then then I'll give him a break. Yeah, that's basically, and since they were the ones who had the original language, we probably screwed it all to hell. And then Michelle was listening to our Island Hotel in Cedar Key podcast, and she said she was a little bit confused because she was trying to figure out what the difference between Tabby and Coquina was. I guess I didn't really think about that there was a difference because we've heard that the Castillo de San Marco is made out of tabby and we've also heard that it's made out of coquina. So I think I just assumed it was the same thing, but I decided to investigate. And upon investigation, I found out that they're actually two different things. One of them is man-made and the other is more natural made. And the tabby is concrete that is in between a bunch of shells. 
whereas the coquina is gravel and such between all of the shells. And this is really something that they pull out of quarries and bring over, whereas the tabby is something that they make. And over in Europe, I don't even know that they have shells in it. I think they make it with other stuff. But the Castillo de San Marcos has both of them used. And I guess the only way you could tell the difference is that the coquina would be rougher than the tabby. Mm, okay. So I was just clearing that up. And I thanked her for asking that question because it was a great question. It was one of those things that makes you ponder for a while. Well, what is the difference in... It's those things that make you say, hmm. Yeah, so I listened back to the show because, to the episode, because I was like, well, what were we talking about and what did I say and did I screw something up? So I'd said in that episode that the Island Hotel was made out of tabby, as was the Castillo de San Marco. And she had lived here in Florida and had heard that the Castillo was made out of coquina. So she's like, is it the same thing? I've never heard of tabby. What is the difference? So that should clear it up for everybody in the audience. And we want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Liz. Hey, Liz. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Chastity. Hey, Chastity. And Buffy. And Buffy, With the an vampire I-E. slayer. I was going to say that. <laughs> I'm sure she hears that all the time. I'm sorry. Bad pun. <laughs> you can you can smack us at the first meetup you meet us at. Exactly. She does spell her name with an I-E, so it is different than the Buffy vampire slayer. But I bet she could slay vampires. I bet you she could. Denise, are you ready to head over to another castle in Scotland? I am. Let's go. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to This Moment in Oddity. This episode's Moment in Oddity was suggested by listener Toby Hesenauer. In 1953, an assistant plumber by the name of Harry Martindale was doing some work in the cellar of Treasurer's House in Chapter House Street near the Minster in York. Poor Mr. Martindale was all by himself in the cold and dank cellar. He was working tediously when suddenly a blast of sound rocked him to his core. He could have sworn that he'd just heard the blast of a horn or trumpet. But why in the world would anyone be blowing a horn down in the cellar? He looked about to see if he could find the culprit. There was no one else in the cellar. He began to wonder if it was possible for sound to have come through the thick stone walls. He placed an ear to the stone, feeling silly since he knew the cellar was underground. Then he got the shock of his life. A Roman soldier on horseback suddenly rode right through the wall. And that was not all. This soldier was soon followed by a whole legion of foot soldiers, each carrying lances and swords and wearing the armor and helmets of a Roman legion. They marched two men wide right past Mr. Martindale. The plumber noticed that the men's calves and feet were below the floor, so they must have been marching on a lower level. The group disappeared into the opposite wall, never indicating that they saw the man. Even more surprising is the fact that archaeological investigation has revealed that a Roman military station used to exist in this very spot, and that a road did indeed used to exist where the treasurer's house now stands. Seeing a ghostly legion of soldiers while working on some plumbing certainly is odd. This Day in History This Day in History was brought to you by Jessica Bell. And we do want to note that the last This Day in History for the Skirvin Hotel was also brought to you by Jessica Bell. 
On this day, February 7th, in 1907, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies organizes their first large procession called the Mud March. The National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies was created from 17 individual groups that were advocating women's suffrage. The union held public meetings, organized petitions, wrote letters to politicians, published newspapers, and distributed free literature. The main demand by the union was for the vote on the same terms as it is or may be granted to men. The Mud March comprised of more than 3,000 women from all classes. These women gathered in London on a cold and miserable day to march from Hyde Park to Exeter Hall, a route that would have taken them past Buckingham Palace, St. James Place, and the National Gallery. Thousands of spectators lined the route. As the sight of women of all ages, classes, and professions marched side by side in horrendous weather throughout a muddied street was a novelty worth withstanding the elements to witness. Newspapers and magazines in Europe and in the United States fixated on the diversity represented in the march. These marches would be a common practice for the Union until women over 30 finally won the vote in 1918. However, the vote would be extended to all women over the age of 21 until 1928. History Goes Bump Podcast. Glam's Castle is considered the most beautiful castle in Scotland. It won the prestigious Best Attraction Award UK 2015. This castle dates back to the 14th century and has remained in the hands of one family for centuries. That family is the Bowes Lyons family, now known as the Earls of Strathmore. Members that have lived here include members of the royal family. Not only is there a deep history to the land, but legends and lore around here as well. Glam's Castle is also considered one of the most haunted castles in the United Kingdom. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of Glam's Castle. The lowland valley of Strathmore in Scotland is home to Glam's Castle. The castle is named for the village that is located nearby. The estate encompasses a massive 14,000 acres. Before the castle was here, the area was home to the Picts. The Picts date back to the 6th century and were around until the 9th century. They left behind monumental stones that are intricately carved with symbols and inscriptions known as Pictish stones. Initially, the Picts were thought to be uncivilized tribal wildmen who fought off the Roman legions, but scholars and archaeologists have found them to be quite different people who were Christianized and built monasteries and they appeared to build with the divine proportion. This ratio of dimensions is 1.618 to 1 and appears in nature, such as in the spiral of seashells and the faces of people considered very beautiful, such as Marilyn Monroe. The Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was built with this measure, as was the Alhambra Palace of Granada in Spain, and the Acropolis in Athens. Even the Egyptian pyramids used this measure. Robert II was King of Scots from 1371 to 1390. He was the grandson of Robert the Bruce. He appointed Sir John Lyon, Thane of Glamis, Keeper of the Privy Seal, which was one of the great offices of state upon his succession. Sir John became Keeper of Edinburgh Castle and Lord Chamberlain later, and he held those titles until his death, which seems to be caused by murder. He was killed while he quarreled with the nephew of the king, Sir James Lindsay of Crawford, Sir John was the husband of King Robert II's daughter, and the king gave them Glamath Castle, which was built in 1376. The castle consisted of a central keep and was built in block style. It was enclosed within a fortified court. The castle was rebuilt with an L-plan tower house in the 15th century. The L-plan design is built just as it sounds, in the shape of an L. This design was very popular in Scotland. It was an expansion on the typical block tower house, which was easier to build, but made defending the entrance of the castle difficult. The L-plan made defense much easier. More changes came for Glam's Castle in the 17th century. The west wing was added, as well as a small northeast wing containing the chapel, which only seats 46 people. Most of the fortifications were replaced with things that would add beauty to the castle, like sculptures, courts, and vistas. 
The trees that crisscrossed the property were planted in the 18th century. Other additions to the castle at this time were a billiard room, updated kitchens, and a new service courtyard that was installed beyond the east wing. The Bose Lions had an estate near Gateshead called Gibside that had a beautiful fireplace with the coat of arms of the Blackiston family that was moved to the billiards room at Glamis Castle. Can you imagine moving a huge fireplace? I don't know how far apart these two places were, Gibside and Glamis, but that would have been quite the undertaking, I would think. Sir William Bose had married Elizabeth Blackiston, which is why the coat of arms was moved. The West Wing was demolished and remodeled and the grounds were groomed into an open parkland the style of which was Capability Brown. Capability was an English landscaper. His given name was Lancelot, so we're not sure why he changed it, but he changed the face of 18th century England with his designs. He believed strongly in the principles of comfort and elegance. Yeah, so your name is Lancelot Brown, and you decide to change your first name to Capability? (laughs) Strange guy. All I know is that everybody wanted him to design their gardens and the front areas of their buildings and such, and he did a great job with it. And when you get a look at this castle, it is beautiful. It is exactly what you think of when you think of a castle with the, the shaping of it and the turrets. And this isn't one of those castles that's falling apart like we've talked about in other stories. This is a castle that still is very well maintained and being lived in. In 1797, the East Wing's roof was replaced with castellations. In 1820, the main avenue was replanted and the Dutch garden that is in front of the castle was planted in 1893. The Italian garden was planted in 1910. The castle as it stands today is magnificent. There's a large central keep and several corner towers, all capped with the conical roofs that castles are known for having. There is a central stair tower, a crenellated roof line, and several projecting turrets. There's also a clock tower that houses the family history and archives. I think we'll definitely put this one on places to visit when we go to that area. The grandson of Sir John, Sir Patrick Lyon, was the first to have the title Lord Glamis, which was created for him in 1445. The sixth Lord Glamis, another John Lyon, married a woman named Janet Douglas. John Lyon died September 17, 1528, from poisoning. It was believed that his wife Janet had done the deed. She was accused of this crime, and she was also accused of treason in December of that year. Janet hated King James V of Scotland, as did her entire family. She had brought supporters of the Earl of Angus, who was her brother, to Edinburgh. The king had imprisoned her brother for his acts against him, so there was no love loss here. Eventually, King James found a way to do away with Janet for good. He had her accused of witchcraft and thrown into the dungeon at Edinburgh Castle. Her family members were tortured into claiming that Janet did indeed practice witchcraft. The punishment at that time was burning at the stake, and Janet was burned at the stake. You might recall us talking about this in the Edinburgh Castle episode. She was the woman burned at the stake in front of her son. And I remember clearly talking about that because I thought how horrible to have her son there to watch that. Because there's no way you could keep back your screams and stuff like that. That would just be such a horrendous way to die. And this was all political in nature. Janet was not a witch. She was not practicing witchcraft. The family was tortured into making these claims. This King James V of Scotland just did not get along with this family. And this is what the result of it was. Whether she really poisoned her husband, we'll never know. But somebody poisoned him. And most people point in that direction. But since she was falsely accused of witchcraft, it's possible that she was also falsely accused of that. Absolutely. And just kind of, I don't know if I want to call it a fun fact, but anybody was listening to the Salem Witch Trials podcast, they might remember that burning at the stake was a practice that was only practiced in Europe. It was not practiced here in the United States, unbeknownst to popular belief. Very true. With Sir John Lyon dead and Janet now dead, King James took Glamis Castle for himself and lived there for a while after 1537. In 1543, the castle was returned to the Lyon family. The Bowes family was a coal mining family and they'd become very rich. Mary Eleanor Bowes married John Lyon, the ninth Earl of Strathmore, in 1767, and that is how the Bowes family became part of the Lyon family. During World War I, the castle served as a military hospital, and Denise has kind of reminded me of the storyline in Downton Abbey of how 
that was turned into a military hospital during World War One as well. So I don't know if they got that idea from this, because that's High Clear Castle, I believe, is the name of the location for Downton Abbey. So I don't know if that was part of their history, too. And it was just something they really did with a lot of these castles is turned them into military hospitals. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll have to look that up. It's a good idea because there was so much land around there and they were fortified. So it was a very safe place to keep wounded soldiers. Glam's Castle has many claims to fame. Mary, Queen of Scots, and her entourage visited Glam's in 1562. Shakespeare wrote Macbeth in 1603, and his main character lives at Glam's Castle. Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was born in 1900. Our listeners know her by her more popular moniker, the Queen Mother. She married Prince Albert, and they lived at Glam's Castle when her second daughter, Princess Margaret, was born meaning that Queen Elizabeth II lived at Glamis Castle for part of her life as well. Glamis Castle appears on the rear side of 10-pound notes issued by the Royal Bank of Scotland. The current owner of the castle is Michael, 18th Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. I thought that was really cool that this castle is where the Queen Mother and her husband lived for many years and where Princess Margaret was born. Absolutely. That's really very cool. Yeah. So I was just reading about, you know, okay, well, they were visited by Mary, Queen of Scots. And most of the castles that we cover, it's these dukes and earls and all these people. We have no idea who they are. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. I know that name. Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. Oh, that's the Queen Mother. I was just like, that is very cool. So I thought, well, if she lived there... Queen Elizabeth II had to have as well. And yeah, there's probably. actually pictures of the current royal family there, uh, Prince Charles and Camilla standing outside of it. And so it gets still visited by the royal family. Legends abound with this property. One of the most well-known legends is that of the secret room. Stories claim that it was made for what was described as a monster. This tale is similar to ones we've covered in other episodes in which a child is born horribly deformed in some way, which would not be surprising with royalty since they did a lot of inbreeding. I know a lot of them went nuts for that reason, and is hidden away from the public. The child in this story is the firstborn son of the 11th Earl. He was born in 1821 with deformities, and the family decided to tell the public that he had died in childbirth. He was then locked up inside a secret room. On the castle ramparts is something called the Mad Earl's Walk, which is where the disfigured child would exercise. A second son was born, and when he was of age, he was told about his brother. When he looked in on his brother still in the secret room, he found him to be healthy and incredibly strong. And the legend claims that the older brother lived for over a hundred years. A tradition was started after this in which the secret of the hidden room is told to the next heir on their 21st birthday. That just is so sad when I think about, you know, what we do for persons with disabilities today Mm -hmm. compared to like what they would do. I can't even imagine just being locked away, you know, like you were some monster. I mean, it reminds me of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, the story of that. And it's just how sad that they didn't have anybody that really, truly cared about them. Yeah, you kind of hope playing devil's advocate that it was for their protection so that society wouldn't kill them or do something horrible to them. But I tend to think that that's not the truth. (laughs) That It was more of a just put them away somewhere and we'll feed them and and let them drink. But that's it. Well, even if it was from the devil's advocate side of it, that's still horrid, you know, that we would hunt them down with sticks and torches like a like a crazed like an animal animal, Mm -hmm. you know, and they shouldn't even do that to animals. But I'll get off that soapbox. But yeah, but it's just sad. There are other stories behind the secret room. Supposedly, the room became public knowledge when a workman was doing some renovating and accidentally broke a piece of the wall, revealing the secret room. He was given a large amount of hush money, but apparently it was not enough. And then, as happens with these sort of things, the public started telling stories about what the room could have been used for. One story was that a vampire child was born to the family each generation and that it was walled up in this room. Another story was that the family used to keep their enemies in the room until they starved to death. This tale may have been inspired by the true story of the Ogilvy family. In 1486, the Ogilvies came to Glamis Castle seeking protection from their sworn enemies, the Lindsay family. The Ogilvies were shown the secret room and invited to stay there where they remained for a month. They were given no food or water, and when the room was opened again, they found only one of the Ogilvies still alive, and he had apparently eaten parts of the rest of the family to keep from starving to death. Proof of the secret room has been sought. One time, years ago, several guests decided to try to find the room. They hung towels outside all of the windows that they could access, and they found that one window had no towel. Was this the secret room? People have also tried counting all the windows from the outside and then counting the windows on the inside, and there are claims that there are always two more windows counted outside than inside. 
There is also the legend about a family curse connected to the castle. Sir John Lyon was tempted to remove an ancestral chalice from the family seat at Fortaviet. He took it even though the law stated that the chalice must remain in that seat forever. Thus a curse came upon the family. Is this where the idea of vampire children being born in each generation started? And we wondered that about the vampire children because there was a legend about these vampire children and that they were walled up in that secret room. And I couldn't find anything in the research about this curse other than they said there was a curse on the family. But we didn't see any proof for a curse because there was nothing that resulted from the curse. No bad implications or such. There are many stories about ghosts at the castle. One of the more unfortunate tales is that of Jack the Runner. He's been seen running around outside the castle and he cries out in agony. Jack was a black slave in the 17th century and one day the earls decided that it would be fun to hunt a human rather than a fox. So they grabbed Jack and told him to run. He was impaled by lances and the hunting dogs ripped him apart. He's not the only black slave who haunts the castle. A young black slave was horribly treated here in the 1800s and died and now is said to haunt a stone seat by the door of the queen's bedroom. The grounds are haunted by an unknown female apparition. Whatever happened to her was cruel as well. She appears to have no tongue in witness reports, so she must do something with her mouth to reveal this to people. Her face appears to be mutilated as well. The best guess as to her identity would be that she was a young woman who was possibly a servant in the castle and that she stumbled onto the secret room and its horrors. She ran from the castle and two royal guard were sent after her. They engaged in the practice of silencing her, which was using iron tongs to rip out her tongue and then throwing it on a fire. Normally a silenced person was left to bleed to death, but this woman is said to have had her neck broken and then she was fed to wild boars on the grounds. The small family chapel plays host to the spirit of Janet Douglas, who was burned at the stake at Edinburgh Castle. She's returned to her home in spirit form and has been dubbed the Grey Lady. So no white lady here. This one's gray. She's been witnessed many, many times by visitors, and many of these sightings have been very recently. The Grey Lady is seen at the clock tower as well. Sir David Bowes Lyon decided to take a walk after dinner one night as he rounded the castle. He caught sight of a young girl gripping the bars outside of one of the castle's windows. She appeared to be trying to get out, and she had very dark and sad eyes. He started to walk toward her to find out who she was, and she suddenly disappeared, as if she'd been ripped away, and it left him quite shaken. A female guest stayed at the castle one evening. The next morning at breakfast, she was asked how she had slept. She commented that she had slept soundly until the carpenters woke her up at 4 a.m. with all their hammer banging and such, and that she thought it was weird that they worked so early in the morning when people would be sleeping. The people sitting at the breakfast table all stared at her in silence. Finally, someone said that there was no construction going on in the castle anywhere. The woman was immediately scared, and the head of the house asked that she not relate this story to anyone else. And they didn't want to talk about it anymore either. Interesting. Makes you wonder what the hammering was all about. Ghostly hammering? Was it somebody pounding in the secret room to get out? Yeah, who what is knows? That, what is that carried over from? Probably the most infamous ghost at the castle is that of Earl Beardy. In the research, two names come up, and there is discrepancy as to who the real Earl Beardy is, but then again, we're talking about a ghost here. The story dates to the 15th century and is either about Alexander Lyon, 2nd Lord of Glamis, or Alexander Lindsay, 4th Earl of Crawford. And again, these two families don't like each other, so <laughs> I don't know how it works out that it's one or the other, but they were neighbors with each other, apparently. The key part is what the Earl Beardy is alleged to have done. He was a man who liked to play cards. He also had a horrible temper. He was a mean guy, not a nice guy at all. And he took a gamble with his words one day when no one would play cards with him. It was the Sabbath and his host refused and the servants also refused to play and warned him about playing cards on the Sabbath. He became enraged and declared that he would play until doomsday every day and that if he had to, he would play with the very devil. Shortly after that, a stranger in dark clothes came to the castle. You've probably guessed who that stranger was and you'd be right if you guessed the devil. Earl Beardy gambles his soul and loses and the devil condemns him to play cards until doomsday. Some claim that his soul is in the secret room playing cards for all eternity. Others claim that they've seen Earl Beardy wandering about the castle or leering over children in their beds. The disembodied sounds of dice rattling and a man swearing have been heard. Glamis Castle has hosted royals for its entire existence and still houses the members of the royal family. This may not just be the living members of the royal family, 
but those who have passed on into the afterlife. Are these legends about the castle true? Is Glam's Castle haunted? That is for you to decide. Definitely a place to go, if nothing else, to get some fabulous pictures. Absolutely. Next up, we have Andersonville Prison, and this one was recommended to us by our listener, John Beaverhausen. So looking forward to sharing that with you guys. We have some reviews to share with you. First up, we have SF Gunther, five stars, so excited to find this podcast. I've been looking for a new podcast to listen to while I was working, and I was excited to find HGB. As someone who grew up in a haunted house and loves spooky places, this is a fun podcast. Well, thank you for that. And I believe that's probably Sarah who told us about her spooky house. New to the crew, MH in NC. Love this show, five stars. This is my new favorite show. When I listen, I feel like I'm getting together with a group of my friends for a great conversation. These ladies are entertaining. They are funny, charming, and knowledgeable all at the same time. The shows are shorter in length, but just the right amount to intrigue me to dig in deeper on my own. This podcast is worth a listen. Makes my workday so much more enjoyable. Well, thank you, new to the crew. And Heathen from Hell, five stars fun. These two ladies remind me of the radio skit that Anna Gasteyer and Molly Shannon performed on SNL. Only they're talking about history and ghosts and not Alec Baldwin's sweaty balls. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun and engaging and can manage to make the most macabre things a little lighthearted and enjoyable to hear. Well, I guess we could talk about some ghost sweaty balls. Uh, let's not say we did. Thank you for that, Heathen. And then we have this review from the UK from Lily 2 I hope I said that right. Great podcast, five stars. Another great ghost podcast to add to my collection. Well, thank you for that. Well, we want to thank all of you for tuning in for this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode was brought to you by our executive producers. Thank you. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump, Listen, The M Writing Podcast, Society 13, Rebuilding Society, one podcast at a time. <laughs>